Oscar's 93 in the map, right? Oscar's 93 in the map. This is, yeah. No, like 93 is low going. Oscar is 32. It's 32, I think. I call this house to order. I congratulate both teams, UBS, uh, UBC, CS, and government, and MIT GM in opposition for making it to the semifinal round of the 2010 North American Debating Championship. On the far right, Jason Rogers from McGill, Joanna Nairn from Hardhouse. On the far left, Brendan Jarbo from Bates, and Brent Kettle from New York. I'm Andrew Rohrbach from Yale. So without further ado, I call upon the Prime Minister to deliver our first, uh, the first constructive speech in this round. Not to exceed, oh, are you doing the PMRE? Uh, no. No, seven no. so seven minutes. Here, here. Here, Speaker. So we think that corporations should be allowed to contribute, uh, like financial, like give financial contributions to political ca campaigns and uh, different political groups. We think that we would allow limits on these donations in the same way that like, we do allow limits on certain individuals. What we would say is that the limit that we place on a corporation will be like substantially larger. And so what we would say is that the limit would be in some way related to a function of the earnings of that corporation. We think that the like the size and the earnings of the corporation in many ways reflects like in a, like general tendencies in terms of how many people they employ and tends to influence the extent to which their policies or what they do or their interests reflects or impacts society in general. We said that all these donations must be public, so if they're going to make donations, it has to be known to whom and what parties they're giving those donations to. But like in general, we want to gauge in a normative discussion as to whether or not corporate donations are a legitimate form of speech and have a beneficial impact on society. I hope there's not too much discussion of like, what will the limit exactly be, because I don't think that's interesting. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about how like corporate interests are significant in the political process. Secondly, I want to talk about free speech. Thirdly, I want to talk about the political message that the limits uh, create. And fourthly, I want to talk about the information gained from having these types of public donations. So firstly, in terms of corporate interests being very significant, we'd say that corporations have a unique perspective on politics that is extremely important both to the political process, but one that's often hidden on an individual basis, right? So we would say that like, there's a conceptual barrier for like individual citizens to understand to the same extent what like what corporate interests are and the way in which harms to corporations can have impacts on individuals. Right? So we say that individuals would always say, like, oh, we should always have like higher minimum wage. We should always do things that have a benefit on an individual level. We would say that it's far easier for corporations both to conceptualize and to express interests that like may be beneficial to corporations, but as a benefit to those corporations, it also benefits greater society. We say that it's really hard to represent those interests without corporate voice being expressed through things like financial donations to the parties that they see most likely to benefit those corporations. We see that as beneficial, right? More specifically, we think that corporate interests can also provide a lot of important important perspectives, right? So like if it's really politically popular, like, oh, we think China's really evil, like we should never trade with China, right? We think that like these types of things, like this is like 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 highly hyperbolic, but we're saying that these types of things can gain a lot of political support on like an optical level and can often disregard corporate like corporate perspectives that are significant in terms of having the best political outcome. Right? So I think it's really easy for a lot of individuals unrelated to corporations to say, like, oh, we shouldn't do these things that are unethical, not recognizing what the actual impact would be on an individual level of doing things like cutting ties that like, have substantial uncertainty in the economy. Certainly, in a political process, you can also reach that conclusion. We think that introducing the political, uh, sorry, the corporate perspective into that discussion better enables and hastens the ability of this discourse to result in these conclusions we think are beneficial. Yes. So why not give like ExxonMobil and Goldman Sachs the right to just vote in our elections? Well, because they're not people. So, like, 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 so, like, so, so, we think that like the most appropriate way to have them influence how elections turn out would be to have them um, like financially contributing. In addition to that, we think one vote for Exxon Mobil is misrepresentative of the extent to which Exxon Mobil's interests have an impact on society, right? So we'd say that the extent to which they have certain interests reflects a far greater impact on society. That's why we modeled it in terms of. Up in terms of general earnings, we think that to give one vote to giant corporations that employ millions is really misrepresentative in terms of political discussion, right? So we don't think that that's, that's sufficient. We think that political, these perspectives can be very beneficial. Now in terms of free speech, we'd say that like to give money is a form of expression, obviously. Like you're giving your advocacy and in addition to that advocacy, you're saying you want to actively support those individuals. 
So we'd say that you can limit speech to the extent that speech is silencing of other forms of speech, right? So we'd say that like, we limit certain forms of speech and we think that the expression of that speech hides other people's speech. We don't think that that occurs in this case. I think I've already shown you the way in which corporate interests can have like, like trickle-down effects to how other people's interests would be affected and have hidden perspectives that other people would not recognize. So I don't think that this form of speech is one that's going to drown out everyone else's perspective. Beyond that, they can't do things like vote. We recognize that, right? We just think that for them to be able to lo like, like lobby, which is different, or just like provide financial contribution in terms of the, pro the party that they support is a beneficial process. We think the limit the speech specifically is opposition saying that there's a particular group that we don't think should legitimately be allowed to express political opinion, right? We think that's really harmful. We think that corporate interests, like individual interests, or any group's interest, right, which like, which like could, like I'm guessing under our paradigm, would be allowed to donate as long as they're not a corporation, right? We think that's silly. We think that Corporations are groups, are associations with individuals, and should be allowed to donate, should be allowed to take part in the political process. So we don't think that this limit is in any way justified because we don't think it's actually silenced. Thirdly, what is the political message of these limits, right? Because essentially there's two things that's telling you. Some are telling you that corporate interest is less important, right, in terms of political discourse. We think that's completely false. I think I've shown you through my first argument why it is that political input, why corporate interests are significant in terms of political discourse. And so I don't think limiting that, that ability to access that discourse makes any sense. The other thing I can tell you is that corporate interests are already acknowledged enough. We also think, don't think that this is the case for the other reason I gave you, right? I think it's really clear that corporate interests or like the perspective of corporations is one that conceptually and just like on a like, like obvious level is one that people wouldn't have easy access to and wouldn't recognize. Right? Because like people working at companies or like being employed by McDonald's wouldn't have a full understanding of the extent to which impacts or harms to McDonald's will necessarily also impact them in terms of price of food, employment, benefits, all those kinds of things. Right? So we think that for these two, these two reasons, this is really beneficial impact, beneficial speech. We think that placing limits on it, which says that this speech is less important, is harmful in terms of how society, how this reinforces society's, society's belief that corporate interests are less important or that corporate interests are over are overrepresented. We think neither of these are true, and we think that that's harmful. Finally, we think that there's information gain. And so what we would say is when you have these donations necessarily public, it, it mandates that when these corporations want to donate to different uh, political parties, that this elucidates to the electorate and to other corporations and to political parties themselves the political interests of these groups, right? So we think that this actually clarifies the motivations of, corporate, uh, of corporations and of political parties, right, to the extent that they receive donations from this group and are obviously influenced by that corporate group, right? So we'd say that this enables better criticism, both state criticism and corporate criticism, when you know the motivations and the political ideologies and the political beliefs, both of your corporations within your country and of the, cor and of the political parties of your country due to the influence of these financial contributions. So we think this elucidation and this clarification of those motivations better enables the electorate both to interact with how they criticize the state and how they criticize different uh, different companies, right? Oh yeah, this is set in like Western liberal democracy, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> so like this isn't in the Sudan. Um, okay, I think that's like pretty clear. But sorry, guys. Right? Um, okay, so yeah, I think all these reasons are why it is that we should give people trouble, um, right? We think corporate interests are extremely significant, and more importantly, on like a deeper level, harder to understand for groups that are not themselves corporate, like corporations. In addition, we think that it's a form of speech that's beneficial both to the discourse, but to the expression of these groups to enable them to protect their interests. Thirdly, we think it sends a harmful message, and fourthly, it provides greater information to the electorate, to the corporations, and to the government. For all these reasons, we stand proudly and proudly. And that fell upon the first speaker of the opposition to open this case to the opposition. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it turns out people, general citizens, voting in elections don't know very much about lots of things. They don't know very much about foreign policy. Why don't we just delegate our decisions on foreign policy making to the experts who know stuff that we don't? We're not very good at making determinations about what's going to happen when we implement this tax policy or don't implement that tax policy, even if it affects us individuals. We on our side of the house realize that people are imperfect. We just think that corporations lower the level of discourse and give them disproportionate influence. So if they want to get up here and say, the reason that it's good that corporations are making these contributions is because it teaches people things that they won't know, we don't think that that's going to be sufficient. And also, we think it's false. Before I get into the main arguments, though, I just want to do what has sort of DPS thing. I want to start out with a model attack. The problem that, with the motion that they've proposed is that they're giving money proportional to how much money a company, uh, sorry, uh, they're give, setting the limit proportional to how much money a company already has, not much how much money it might get. So what this means is in fields like, I don't know, fuel, 
the established companies, the oil companies, get all the influence, whereas startup companies looking into all the have established market presence don't get almost any ability to contribute whatsoever. So on that ground alone, this de definitively entrenches the self-interest of the status quo. We think even if all of our other arguments are wrong, that itself means that the discourse can't happen like they say, and there's a sufficient reason for them to drop. No, thank you. Now though, let's talk about sort of corruption. We've got a number of ways in which we think their side of the house corrupts elections and corrupts outcomes. I'd like to divide these into two parts. Firstly, how does their side of the house corrupt elections? Well, firstly, in primaries, when it's, when it's being decided who's going to be the, the candidate fielded by a particular party, there are generally many individuals, and there isn't a great amount of attention being paid to their views. What happens frequently is that one corporation or a number of corporations pick out the pro-business candidate and give them a lot of money so that they can stand out from the rest of the group. But the outcome of that, of that is that there's a systemic pro-business bias in almost every primary, at least in the United States, and I would imagine in the Canada that their side of the House would impose. That means that the only people who are presented by both parties tend to be those who were sort of hand-picked by the corporations early on in elections. If you want an example of this, look at why George W. Bush won the 2000 Republican primary rather than John McCain. It was the fact that he was pro-business and able to raise a great deal of money from the oil companies in Texas. No thank you. We furthermore think that there's a need to have proper representation that isn't based on how much money you have. If we really felt like we should give companies more influence in our democratic process based on the amount of money that they had, we should be okay with giving them votes in our election proportional to, say, how many employees they had. We think that that's a bit of a tension that they have on their side of the house. Additionally, we just don't buy this as a general statement. Why don't we give rich people a higher amount of money that they can donate in political campaigns? Because maybe they employ more people, or maybe they have more people who work on their gardens, or something like that. We just don't think that they can have this general standard that applies to corporations but not to individuals. But finally, on this idea of corruption, we say on our side of the house that the general perception, even if false, that corporations control our political process lowers voter turnout dramatically and makes people disengage from the, the democratic process because they feel like whoever they pick, it's going to be in the pocket of special interests. And as a consequence, we get very many fewer people actually voting in our elections. We think that that's a problem because we get less representation. Sure. Where did Obama get the money for his campaign? Right, obviously there are exceptions to this, right? But we think that the fact is generally, Obama's like obviously a very special case in many, many ways. We don't think that we can think of as like the, the single example. Furthermore, we think that uh, he actually did get some donations from companies, he just didn't talk about them much because it was unpopular. That's one of the reasons why we think that people would generally be happy with our policy. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the corruption of policies. Because realize that even if exactly the same people get elected on both side of the, sides of the House, they're going to face worse incentives on their side of the House by virtue of the policy that they have in place. The first way I want to talk about this is the idea of regulatory capture. It turns out that most companies are not really interested in the good of society. They're interested purely in their own interest, in their own profits. In fact, they're legally bound to be only interested in their own profits. That they're going to focus their contributions not on general issue stuff, not on which candidate is better most of the time, but instead on things that directly affect only them. Here are some examples. The reason that financial regulation is having trouble getting off the ground in the United States is because the only people who are donating money to the cause are the companies that would be regulated by it and they're spending money to oppose it. The only reason that we have, the reason that the US keeps increasing military spending to the most ridiculous level anywhere in the world is because the military contractors are the only ones who are spending money on deciding how this issue on, on, on trying to influence the debate on how this issue should go. We furthermore think that there's a problem when foreign corporations on their side of the house, who don't necessarily employ any or many Americans, can come into or Canadians, can come into our country and say, we're going to influence and screw up your democratic process because we want to make more money in Germany or China or Japan. We think that that's hugely problematic at the point at which it makes our system not democratic, but lets basically foreigners vote in our elections meaningfully by skewing the democratic discourse towards them. What we'd say furthermore, though, uh, finally, and, and as, as our final independent point, we think that there's a huge dead weight loss that's permitted and encouraged on their side of the house. Because if there are two companies that are fighting it out for a regulation, they both have an incentive to race to the bottom, to donate as much money as possible and hit their caps, uh, for fear that the other guy will if they don't. 
This means that tons of corporate money is going to be wasted on their side of the house on doing things that don't necessarily influence the outcome of the debate because the other side is arguing the other side of that and spending lots of money. What's the consequence? All that money could have been spent on paying their workers higher wages, on giving higher dividends that allow the country to be in this All of these are things that we can't do when these companies waste their money duking it out in the, in the money sphere of political TV ads and elections. We think that's a huge problem. Now, what do they say on their side of the house? They say corporations have a perspective on policy that's really unique, and they're the only way to get this perspective out into public. So three responses to this. Firstly, we think that there's lots of historical examples to see what happens when the government does stuff. So if, there, if there's an argument that like raising minimum wages would decrease employment, which is actually not necessarily true on the margins, we can look at the historical data. There are always going to be individuals, think tanks and things like that, who actually do the research and have no agenda to push and can give us sort of an independent answer on these sorts of things. We would secondly say we can look at historical examples within our own country of similar things that we've done. And finally, what we would say is that there's always going to be an incentive for someone to run on the ground of not raising minimum wages to appeal to employers who actually vote in our elections. So it's not like this is going to leave the democratic discourse altogether. This sort of is also a response to their form of advocacy, well, the, the uh, argument. We think that it's OK to silence speech if it's harmful to the democratic process when the person who's saying it doesn't have rights. We don't believe that corporations have rights. We don't give them a jury of their peers when we try them. We don't think they have right. And we think that we get better information by not having these corporations contributing to the discourse. We think they corrupt the process. I thank the speaker for his remarks. Now I call on the second speaker from the government to continue the case of the government bench. Here, here. We allow people who are below the age of majority to contribute to election campaigns. There are a lot of cases where we allow people who don't have a vote to contribute to election campaigns because we think it's a good way for them to convince people who do have a vote that they should be voting in line with their interests, right? So we think that when he gets up here and he's like, you're corrupting the electoral system because you're basically giving corporations a vote, we think that that's like, like, he's missing a fundamental distinction about why this is, like, a much better way to engage corporations with the political system, right? So, first of all, what did you hear from Josh? So, Josh said that corporations function in a lot of ways as representative bodies. Of, as bodies which have unique interests and interests which are, like, valuable to political discourse, right? Like, a corporation is going to know what's in a corporation's interest and, like, Frankly, as we've seen with like what happens to economies when massive corporations fail, corporate interests are really important to a lot of other people, and we think that corporations are best able to represent their interests. And we think that it's good to give corporations the ability to represent their interests to voters via political discourse, right? So what's like what's the important point here, right? So when you're allowing them to like give money to people, what you're saying is like it becomes a part of the political discourse what corporate interests are. Now Josh got up here and he told you that, listen, corporations are like giant lobby groups because they have such massive impacts on economies and things like that, they already wield a massive amount of power politically. The issue is that when you don't allow them to contribute to campaigns, all of this discussion happens behind closed doors. Like don't get the impression that on opposition benches, corporations aren't going to be in like influencing politics. What you have on our side of the house is you have public lists of, contri of contributors to campaigns so you can see which cor corporations contributed to which candidates and then you allow for people to recognize how corporate interests are influencing the policies of politicians that they may or may not be elected. Like we think that's really good. Like finally a very obvious point that like Josh like didn't bring up, but I think I'm gonna mention is the fact that like when you have more money being given to political campaigns, you have a greater ability for politicians to engage with the public, right? Like we think that's a benefit. We think more political ads, more people able to engage with the political system are very, very good things. We Sorry. think those are benefits that you get on our side of the house. Yeah. But how do you explain the fact that when there are more uh, advertisements on TV and more negative advertisements that voter turnout goes down? 
like, okay, more negative advertisement terms, like, makes voter turnout go down, like, positive advertisements and stuff, make voter turnout go up. Like, if you looked at the Obama campaign, which I know you don't think is significant, but I think it's, like, a really good model for, like, how political advocacy and advertising can work, it was a snowball effect, right? Like, once you started engaging voters, like, more voters got engaged, and he was able to, like, further engage more voters, right? Like, we think that politicians are retarded. They're going to run ads which will engage people and will make people turn out to vote for them, right? Like, to the greatest degree possible. Like, now that people know how, like, ineffective negative, like, negative campaigning is, like, I think a lot of them tend to try and avoid it. I think we saw that, like, pretty convincingly in <coughs> recent elections. All right, so basically we've told you there's a massive transparency benefit, which we think is, generally speaking, a benefit to discourse surrounding politics, right? Like, we're not, like, as much as corporations are a representative body, like, we would have a problem with giving them a vote because we don't believe in, like, mediated voting, right? Like, you're not allowed to give your vote to someone else and have them vote for you. We don't allow lobby groups to vote, etc., etc., etc. But we, we do allow them to influence political discourse. We think there's a big distinction there. And we think that all of the benefits fall on our side of the house. All right. So, what did we hear from the side opposition? So, first of all, they had this, like, model nitpick where they're like, listen, like, poor corporations aren't going to be able to be treated because you're giving them a lower, like, uh, a lower limit. Like, first of all, poor corporations have less money to contribute, so we think that harm is kind of marginal. Like, furthermore, we think, like, people with money obviously have a greater ability to engage with things which cost money. We think that the benefits of having these corporations engaging is, like, far outweighs the, like, negative harm of maybe having, like, renewable energy interests, not being, like, able to like, give as much money to corporations. Like, also, I think that's false. A lot of, like, energy companies in the United States, like the one that my mom works for, have, like, massive renewable energy energy, like, renewable energy interests, like, they make a ton of money off of renewable energy because it is very popular for them to install, like, I don't, like, yeah, that's a red um, but, like, we also think that, like, the amount of money that a corporation makes is, like, like, usually reflects the level of influence they have on things like the economy, the level of influence they have on various people's lives, right, because corporations which have high earnings tend to employ a lot of people, they probably have a lot of stockholders, like, whatever else, like, we think that this is a fine metric. Um, and so we think this. Okay, so then he says it's going to corrupt elections by allowing pro-business interests into the election arena. Like, first of all, we would question whether or not having business interests represented in electoral discourse is necessarily corruption. Furthermore, we don't think it excludes people who don't want to pander to business interests, right? I brought up the example of Obama. He's like, you can't just use one example. Like, he only gave you one example, too. But, like, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> What Obama did in his campaign can serve as a model for how you can engage like with popular appeal and sort of like go around corporate interests. Like if Obama did get a bunch of co co contributions from corporations, like I think that's something that should be talked about too. So that's fine. Um, he's like, they corrupt policies because corporations are only going to be advocating like in their own interests. Like I think this would be a problem if we were going to allow corporations to actually like govern the country, right? Like we think there's tons of other advocacy groups which can advocate for different interests. We think that individual voters are capable of evaluating like, yes, we shouldn't abolish minimum wage because that's bad, like even if corporations want to do it, right? So we think that there are like a lot of checks on corporate power in this situation, especially when all we're giving them is like a discursive into politics, when we think they already have a huge in in terms of influence and stuff. We think it's important that they can represent those interests to voters as opposed to just representing those interests to politicians, right? Finally, he said, like, makes this really weird point about how corporate money is wasted because they're going to spend a whole bunch of money without being able to influence the outcome of elections. Like, I thought this point was a bit weird because, I mean, he was just telling me that we're basically giving them votes in elections, like, in which case, like, obviously there is some sort of impact and it's not a waste of their money if they're going to be getting things from it. Like, second of all, I'd assert that corporations, like, aren't totally moronic. Like, I mean, I know he's talking about, like, races to the bottom and stuff, but I mean, like, again, we still think there's a net benefit to society of corporations giving massive amounts of money to political campaigns because you increase voter engagement, because you increase discussion about politics, things like that, all of which we think are, like, objectively goods in democratic societies, like, representing interests which exist, increasing discourse, increasing the levels of, what, of which voters are informed about what's going on in politics. And I call upon the second speaker for the opposition to deliver the final instructions.
like a think tank that publishes peer-reviewed research to try and influence the political process with things like facts and the public interest. Corporations are, as Adam said, legally bound to maximize their profits. If they don't do that, their shareholders sue them, and then the people that were there making the, the socially responsible decisions get kicked off of the board of directors, and they're not allowed to continue making money. So what are some examples where this happens? Well, when companies are forced to maximize profits, that leads to things like rigged research that we've seen throughout history by oil companies. It leads to the, de it leads to the defeat of environmentalist policies. All of these things where we have a tragedy of the commons in terms of publicly owned resources because it's in the individual interest of each of these corporations to exploit them as much as possible. That's how you have policies like the Healthy Forest Initiative that the Bush administration passed, which allowed logging companies to go into our national parks and cut down all the trees. Healthy Forest Initiative indeed. Also, financial regulation. When you have financial regulation that cuts credit spreads and lowers profits, financial companies have to, do, have to actually fight against that, otherwise they're not maximizing their own profits. What that leads to are things like the financial crisis, because they take unnecessary risks and also, splitting the investment arms off of traditional banks. It would be a lot better if the banks that were holding our, our deposits that were FDIC insured in the United States actually didn't have these incredibly risky investment arms, but those are the things that make the profits, and those are the things that they have to do. That's why these companies actually don't want these regulations. Also, look at antitrust. The really good example here is the monopoly Microsoft. They were under investigation by the Clinton administration and were on the verge of being broken up. Then, magically, the Bush administration was elected. They appointed a new attorney general, and for some reason, all of the investigations stopped. Microsoft corporate influences into these political things are not just getting information to the public, they clearly have ulterior motives, they're required to, this is a big problem in the election. Okay, obviously we think it's good for corporations to maximize their profits and act in a self-interested way or they wouldn't be legally bound to do it. We think that it's good that corporations act in this way in our economy because when corporations at maximize profits, they provide jobs for people, they increase the amount of economic, like, they increase the amount of economic productivity that they have, they increase the amount of economic surplus, which leads to more goods for people, higher quality of life. All of these things are great things for our economy, they're not great things for our political system. Alright, now we want to talk about protecting speech. So they assert that corporations for some reason have this right to speech. Why do we think this is necessary? Well, their own standard that they said is that they think as long as it's useful to the process and doesn't cause problems that we should allow it. Well, first of all, we think the potential to muddy the waters and flood the airwaves with rhetoric and, and these kinds of issue ads that have things like rigged, uh, rigged research in them and other things actually does shift the public discourse in a harmful way. It is harmful to speech in the political process. When a single corporation can, with a, a relatively small amount of money compared to the size of Exxon Mobil or Goldman Sachs completely flood state elections or completely flood local elections or primaries where there isn't as much of the public exposure, where there isn't as much individual contributions, that is a problem. Why doesn't the Obama example matter? Because that's something where there are hundreds of millions of people that are making individual contributions, where there's hundreds of millions of people paying attention. But every state senate election, every state representative election, every single primary that occurs, none of these have the same kind of attention gathering as having a disproportionate impact. Why do we think this tyranny of wealth is bad in the political process? Because money, unlike every other resource, can be disproportionately gathered under small groups of people, under individuals. That's a big problem when they have a disproportionate influence in our political process because it leads to these really terrible outcomes. Okay, what do we think corporations can actually do? We think it's fine if corporations do things like fund peer-reviewed studies that actually put information into the, into the public. We think it's fine when think tanks do studies. We think it's fine when the government funds things like the General Accounting Office to look into issues and determine what the objectively valid thing is to do. We think it's fine when politicians are elected and after they get elected, they don't have a debt to repay to corporations in the form of special interests. Adam provides this really, really good example about primaries where corporations actually fund primary candidates for both political parties who happen to be like the, the pro-business leaning Democrat and the pro-business leaning Republican, which means that, yeah, they have different views on other things, but in the, at the end of the day, the election, when you're actually choosing between the two candidates on the ballot for the only two political parties, the only people that are there are the pro-business candidates. That's a big problem. That actually lowers people's political choice. Okay, so now let's go into what they have to say.
So on the model attack, he says, oh, this isn't a big deal. Poor corporations have less money anyway. And then high earnings leads to lots of employees. Well, banks and like ExxonMobil actually have the highest earnings. They also happen to have the highest average salaries per employee. We think that places that actually have a lot of employees are companies like GM and Ford and FedEx and all these other companies that are going bankrupt. We think that this, like, this actual correlation between the amount of money they have and the number of people they employ actually doesn't exist. That's why if what they're going for is trying to get more representation to people, that, to like groups that actually represent more people, they should just give that representation to people, right? Also, there's another contradiction in their efficacy. When they say that they're okay with individual contribution limits, it means that they're actually not okay with wealth being the thing that influences the amount of political presence that you have. It actually is due to the number of people. We think it's a lot better to just continue and allow people to vote. That seems a lot better. Okay. So then, the I think the only thing that they actually have left is that it's better to bring these things out in the public. So this is an interesting question, right? If corporations are secretly influencing all of these elections, why not just let them do it and then we will know it's happening? Well, we think that this is another problem that can be solved more directly. And we actually have more or less solved it in a lot of situations where information disclosure laws and extensive transparency in donors actually means that we know when, when political candidates have corporate donations. The problem is that those corporate donations in primaries mean that all of the political candidates have corporate donations and when you're trying to compare one to another and, and try and vote for the one that doesn't have these kinds of corporate influences there just isn't an option when it comes down to the final election the other thing is that this argument by you're out of order. This argument's underlying assumption is that this influence is bad. When they stand up here and they say, well, at least we can see it's happening, the underlying assumption there is that it's bad and that we should know that it's happening, right? Like, that's a huge contradiction in the case. Okay, so they say if we can't beat them, join them. We say we can beat them, we shouldn't join them. So what do you have at the end of the day? Corporations are special entities. They deserve special consideration, but they don't deserve special rights in our political process. We're very proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for his remarks, and now recall the first speaker proposition of the first publication of the round. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So what we basically heard, the retreat of side government, is that if we don't let these corporations advertise and they're dead set on influencing our elections, then, we, then they're just going to do it behind closed doors and that's going to be really bad. What we say is, when politicians are elected without owing debts to corporations, they're not going to feel like they have to go behind closed doors in order to, to acquiesce to what the company wants. We can check on this as well, which they also believe is bad. And yes, we can also have public disclosure laws about what's going on behind closed doors. The only other major issue that we get from side government is that this is going to make sure that we elevate the level of democratic discourse in our country. We completely disagree and think we're winning on every single one of the arguments. So let's go through them. Firstly, let's look at the distinction between kinds of corporations. Because contrary to what side government says, it's not the case that all corporations behave exactly the same. There are some corporations that are monopolistic. That the reason that they have so much money is because they've accumulated a great deal of market power, not because they're the best or the most enlightened. These companies are inherently conservative. Any regulation, any upstart company is inherently a threat to them, even if that upstart company would be better for the public interest. So those corporations are necessarily risk averse and averse to changes in the status quo. That's why those companies run attack ads on every new proposal that would change the status quo. It's why they run attack ads against healthcare in the United States. It's why they run attack ads against financial regulation and all of the other things that are incredibly popular in the United States that everyone in the United States pretty much wants to happen, but that doesn't happen because these attack ads depress voter turnout and manipulate individuals' behavior. The other possibility, though, is competitive corporations, corporations that are actually in a game with other companies. We say the problem with their advocacy is twofold. Firstly, in competitive markets, they make the market stagnant because upcoming corporations can't advertise until they've employed just as many people as the existing companies. That means that the, the regulations necessarily favor the incumbents and that we get less flexibility in our economy. We also, though, think that this is rent-seeking, because among the established existing competitors, they all feel like they all have to advertise on any issue to make sure that the other person, the other company they're competing against, doesn't get to first. We think this is terrible, and we think it's bad for our economy. 
So how do we think that we get the best political discourse? What we say in our side of the House is that there's already an incentive for politicians to represent all sides of all issues. If it's the matter of the minimum wage, company, individual candidates will run because they want to get the appeal of business and small business owners. Other co companies will run anti-environmental uh, positions because they want to appeal to the loggers and people like that. The problem is, when those individuals disproportionately represent the individuals who make it through our primaries, when most people aren't paying attention, and when the person who can get the most bankrolls from the most companies is necessarily the one who wins the elections. So we think that we get the same level of discourse, the same ideas out in public, but we think that we don't push our democratic process towards the powerful and the wealthy, but rather preserve our democratic process as what it should be, an equal representation of all human beings. We're proud of you. Remarks, and I will call the Prime Minister to deliver the final speech of the round. Here, here, here. Okay, so first to quote the second off speaker. Um, so, like, these things are all good for the economy. Like, remember the speech he gave for 30 seconds on all the benefits of corporate profit? But they're not good for the political system. Like, like to dissociate the economy from the political system is ridiculous. Look at the extent to which the economy in the United States and the faulting economy in the United States has negatively harmed the political system as a result of that, right? Like, economies are essential to the functioning of, like, the economy, which benefits a lot of people, but as well have many political ramifications. His entire <coughs> litany of how corporate profit has many benefits is why we think this speech and this in, in, like engagement in discourse is a good thing, right? So first of all, I'm talking about what is the ideal political discourse that we're looking for? We think that political discussion finds the best resolution through competing perspectives that reach that conclusion, right? I think what we've shown you is that all views should be present, even if disproportionately. Like, recognize that like many views come in partially disproportionately. Like, any political view will come in disproportionately because different numbers of people have different views. We think the greatest harm you can have is when certain views are completely excluded from political discourse, right? Like, we are not, but like, and we don't think that happens in this, right? Like, if you do not allow these groups to donate, the, the view of profit, of corporate profit, of corporate interest is completely excluded from political discourse when it comes to financial contributions. I think all the benefits they talk about and that we talk about in terms of corporate profit dictate that this is a view that can be beneficial and should be included. Is it a little disproportionate? Like, maybe. But we think that the inclusion of that is far better than the absolute exclusion of corporate profit from political discourse. We think that it's extremely problematic. Beyond that, he says that they just care about profit. But Mr. Speaker, who else really cares about corporate profit, right? Like, how many individual citizens are like, I'm going to vote on corporate profit? Like, almost no one. And to the extent that they say that corporate profit can have many benefits is the reason why like, my analysis in my first speech has been completely not engaged with. Because the issue of corporate profit can have many very beneficial societal impacts, but it's difficult for individual citizens to conceptualize in the way in which it benefits them. Right? So like, we think that that's really problematic. Beyond that, all the harms they talk about are completely hyperbolic, right? Because it gives a bunch of like really incompetent Bush era policies, right? Like many Canadian governments have done extremely incompetent things without any corporate corporate influence. So, like, things like happen and are really stupid and like are not as corporately influenced as they're saying, right? Like incompetent policies happen all the time. We think the best policies will be reached when corporate, in addition to non-corporate discourse, can engage with each other and find what the best solution is, combining both those interests. Finally, what's the impact on elections, right? Because Opt mischaracterizes their world as like completely a like like not impacted whatsoever by corporations. We've shown you that this is like inevitable, but that our forum is more public and thus more transparent in terms of who's trying to influence who, right? Is this silencing speech? We disagree because the Obama administration, and look at all the pundits discussing Obama's recruitment and Obama's fundraising, has said that this is the new model that will be used as a means of gaining those money. The model of getting small donations from many people is what is winning in current discourse as to what is the best model for fundraising. We don't think that this is anyway going to destroy that. We don't think the corporations are able to beat him, obviously. Finally, like we think that turnout is not ne necessarily only impacted by like corporate influence, which happens already. But in addition, has like racial demographics, accessibility issues, all of these things impact turnout. I think that's completely false. For those reasons, we stand proudly in favor of introducing this into political discourse with all of the courts. I thank the speaker for his remarks. My first question is to Andrew. Runs over. Please leave the room.